Hi folks, let's walk through how we made this connecting rod link bar piece for Project Egress. Looks like a relatively simple part, but some really good lessons here on work holding, on optimizing your tool paths, and we're using a Harvey lollipop cutter to machine the undercuts for the universal joint. Buckle up, we make a few mistakes, but hopefully everybody learns something. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. holding the part in our mod vise, giving it a quick deck off with a super fly. And then we're trying to do the majority of the work with a few tools for this part. Fewer tools is always a good thing, fewer tool changes and better consistency in height and accuracy. We also ran this part a number of times. I wanted to find out what's the hardest that we could push this recipe and these tooling, but stay within a good process reliability framework. I'm machining the left edge of the stock only as a backup. Our plan when we flip the part is to use the center of the bore for our work co coordinate system, but that edge gives me another machined datum that I can reference if needed. Next up, 2D adaptive to open up those bores, running not at the normal 10,000 RPMs on the 770, but rather at 7,000. We have a little bit more torque here, so we're able to maintain that 2,007 inch feed per tooth. And a lot of times I would have pre-drilled this, but again, I wanted to minimize the use of additional tools here, and there's nothing wrong with doing a helix or ramp-in style, especially on a free cutting material like aluminum. A 2D contour to clean up that inside geometry, especially important on this bore because we're going to use that as the datum when we flip it. So we duplicated that 2D contour and we're doing the first one really just to clean up the geometry for our lollipop cutter, which has to machine a bit past the part because of the nature of that cutter. But then I do a second 2D contour that's all the way uh, at the stock bottom to give us a good clean geometry when we flip the part. And then surfacing in this fillet right here. So this kicked my butt and it shouldn't have to, but it was a really good time to just pause and figure out how to get the machine motion the way we wanted it. And the key is a good tool path with a good point distribution that then matches the way your controller wants to see that tool path. If you watch our channel, you've probably heard me mention smoothing before. I'll duplicate this scallop right now. I'll call it smoothing example. Right click, edit, passes, smoothing. If we read that hover up menu, smooths the toolpath by removing excessive points and filtering arcs where possible. Smoothing is used to reduce the code size without sacrificing accuracy, subject to your tolerance. Smoothing works by replacing collinear lines with one line. So if we can collapse two separate lines into one line and never deviate to our tolerance, Similarly, tangent arcs to replace multiple lines in curved areas. So that's nice. Instead of a bunch of lines, we can do it with one nice smooth arc motion. This all has to do with what the motion profile your machine wants and how it's going to send the signals to those motors to turn it and make that machine go. If you've got older CNC machines, the code size, the file size can be a huge limitation. On modern machines, you've got to pay attention to the kind of code your controller wants. So that's why I wanted to play around with PathPilot here turn smoothing on, we'll make it say five times greater than our tolerance. And the tolerance here is how far the toolpath can deviate from the solid model. The smoothing happens thereafter. It takes that tolerance toolpath and says, hey, can I collapse some of this down subject to your smoothing accuracy? So if we take a look with no smoothing on, we have more points. Here we have less. If we take it to the extreme, we'll drive our tolerance down to one ten thousand. So this toolpath really accurately has to follow our solid model, but we'll make our smoothing tolerance something quite large. In fact, Fusion will give us this warning that it's significantly greater. It's just a warning, no problem running that if you wanted to. And now you can see that dense cloud of black points has gone to almost nothing. But here's the thing, you don't even have to do this on PathPilot because PathPilot does a really good job of handling this on its own with its G64 command. If you want to nerd out, we'll put a link to the Linux CNC detail on the trajectory planning. When Tormach replaced Mach 3 with PathPilot, they did a lot of work on the trajectory planning and then shared that back with Linux CNC, which is what PathPilot is based on. 
But I think this sentence really sums it up. A G code program can never be fully obeyed. If you program a G1, X1, F10, that means go to a position of X1 at a feed rate of 10. Well, it can't go at a feed rate of 10 because it has to accelerate and it has to decelerate. So it's funny to me that that G code that we spend so much time making is actually just another step in the process to how your machine actually moves and the controller itself and its hardware actually does more work. And that's what this G64 command is. So what does G64 do and what does the P and the Q do? G64 alone means keep the best speed possible no matter how far away from the program point you end up, which is actually kind of a bad thing if you think about it because you're sacrificing accuracy to maintain speed, but a lot of times we're more concerned with accuracy than speed. So that's where we can add P's and Q's. The P tolerance means the actual path that the machine actually moves will be no more than P away. So if it can slightly round a corner or an arc to maintain speed and that rounding that off doesn't deviate more than P will preserve our speed. And by the way, speed is more, more than just how fast the part gets done. It has to do with the fluidity and the motion and the quote unquote smoothness of the machine itself. Q has to do with collapsing lines. I think the Tormach explanation is actually better here. Q if present is the maximum deviation that will collapse a series of lines into a single line. To exaggerate, if we have two lines like this, and it can collapse those into one line like this, and the deviation is less than Q, so that here that would really be the distance between this and this, kind of shown like there, it'll go ahead and collapse it. That's one less line of code for the machine to parse and for the motors to have to react to. You can see here the default Tormach settings on the Tormach post in Fusion include a G64, that's a good thing because I think there are benefits to it. It's a bad thing because what I just mentioned, it's going to sacrifice accuracy at any cost to maintain speed. So what we did on this file was I did a bunch of, <laughs> I ran the scallop test a bunch of times trying to experiment with that mix of P's and Q's for the path pilot control, as well as the various different smoothing and tolerance settings within Fusion. And what I found is that the Fusion code doesn't really matter. It actually kind of reminds me of a, of a Heidenhain control, which Heidenheins really like a lot of points because they say, hey, we'll handle, you know, we, the control, we'll handle those points on our own. Just give me a bunch of points. And that seems to be how, how PathPilot's working here, which is a good thing. What I found was the P value wasn't that sensitive, but I do like that to stay relatively low because that does relate back to the tolerance and accuracy of the part. Um, Q, when I had it at three or four thou, didn't seem to do much, but when I hit five thou, really made a performance difference. So you can see here, if we strip out the G64, it's not something that would normally happen, you can see that motion profile. Now we'll run it at the regular G64, which is probably how your machine has been run if you haven't tweaked this. And then finally, we'll go back to that footage of the scallop operation with the modified G64 P's and Q's. much nicer motion profile. Next up, the lollipop, which reminds me to mention that I believe the only toolpath in Fusion 360 that currently supports undercut or lollipop style end mills is 3D Contour. Good news is it's incredibly easy to use. We have our two chains selected, the left and the right. Shout out to Rob Lockwood for the tip on your additional offset should be slightly more then whatever you have in your tolerance, that can help you avoid errant toolpath behavior. As an example, here's a Fusion 360 sample file which has unacceptable toolpaths where they're water falling over the side of the part. On this sample file, the tolerance under the passes tab is set to four ten thousandths of an inch, and we have no additional offset. So what we've told Fusion is that it can deviate from the solid model by up to four ten thousandths of an inch, which is why in somewhat random locations, that toolpath falls over the side of the part. The fix for it is quite easy. Under the geometry tab, we set a negative additional offset that's slightly bigger than that tolerance that pulls the toolpath back in to make sure it's inside any of that tolerance deviation. And there we have a perfect toolpath.
flip the part over. Forget before we put our part in that we first need to measure the top of the parallel because that's the location of our Z on our coordinate system. Probe in our hole. And we're doing a both ways adaptive this time. We're doing a reduced optimal load on the other way, which is conventional machining. Ran fine, it does save some time. Do notice though, we have a little bit of gouging. That's a byproduct of the fact that the way we're making this part is by tabbing it or window machining it. So when that adaptive comes in, we've controlled the stock zone with a sketch. So it thinks what you see is the purple area is the stock. So it thinks it can plunge slightly outside of that. face off our part to get that final surface finish. Ramping down just enough to expose the surface we need to come back and do our scallop again. And then finally tabbing it on any 2D contour under geometry tab, we have built in tabs. You can set them by distance or you can switch that to points and you can actually control the exact points that you want your tabs at. Really slick feature. We made a number of these parts and we kept just goofing a little bit on our tab heights because I'm getting greedy, I'm trying to get that delicate balance of a thin tab, but still having it work hold enough. I think the next time I do a part like this, what I'll do is ensure we have sufficient tabs left. Four is fine here. I don't have a problem with the initial tabs, but then as you clean those tabs up, I think I'd leave those initial tabs thick enough so that you could then really finish machine at least one, if not two of the other remaining tabs. Then you can come in and whittle away at the very last tab, staying off the actual workpiece with a radial stock to leave. That way your cutting tool and the tool pressure is only on the tab and the raw material. It's not actually contacting your workpiece. Tabs can be tricky. You've got to balance a thick enough tab so that the part remains secure and can handle whatever cutting pressure you're subjecting the part to as you're doing that finishing operations, but too thin and the part can break away or chatter. So stick around and click that subscribe button. We've got some other videos coming on three axis and five axis tabbing, but here's an easy trick when you're just doing a one-off type of part. Use hot glue. We've got it's back. We've got our four tabs left. We can now use hot glue to secure the part in place. You can either use one end mill to come through and clean those up or pro tip, keep a dedicated hot glue end mill. It tends to load up, you can clean them out, but use that tool as a sort of a roughing tool that removes most of the hot glue from the tabbed area. Then you can come back with a good finishing end mill and clean that part up. Because you've already removed that hot glue, you'll have much better chip evacuation and you'll get much better finishes. And then when you're done, you can use force, heat, or acetone to break away and clean up the hot glue and your part is done. As always folks, hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed, take care, see you soon.